Noah Church here. It's been a long time, I know, but this is a new year, 2016. Hopefully you're starting it off right. Today I've got a special video. This is from last year, November 16th, 2015. Myself and a friend of mine, Dr. Todd Love, who's a psychotherapist specializing in treating guys with porn addiction, we spoke to the student body at the College of Charleston, South Carolina. Each semester, this college hosts a really cool event. It's called the Think Differently Forum, to which they invite speakers like myself to come and talk about controversial issues. And as you might imagine, the issue on hand last, year, last semester was porn addiction and porn-related problems. And many college students, well, they use porn without ever having heard or realized or read that it can be problematic, that it can cause issues with real life relationships and sex. I was one such unaware college student. So I was delighted to come to this college campus and speak to the students there and get that opportunity. The following is that video. Enjoy. Are just not willing to discuss porn use in the open and constructive way. But the fact that I was invited here tonight and that all of you brave souls came here with open minds makes me happy. So please give yourselves a round of applause. As Jessica said, I'm Noah Church, and the first thing I'd like to ask you to do, or I guess the second thing now, is take a moment and silence your cell phones. It's important because if your phone does go off, that's your signal to me that you're volunteering to come on down and answer some potentially embarrassing porn-related questions. <laughs> So if you'd like to avoid that, just go ahead and silence your phone. Now, this forum is going to be a lot of fun. And as we get started, I want to get to know what you all already think about porn, what your friends say about it, what you've heard in the media, and what you believe. Since there are quite a few of us here today, here's how that's going to work. If I ask you a question and your answer is yes, or I pose a statement that you agree with, I'd like you to just clap for a couple of seconds. And if you really agree, you can whistle or stomp or shout or anything like that, I'm not going to stop you. And I'll try not to ask anything too embarrassing so that you won't be scared to clap in front of your friends. Let's practice. Show me what a yes sounds like. Perfect. Give me a hell yeah. All right, let's try uh, Noah. Your words, they cut to the very core of my soul. I've never agreed with anything more in my life. All right, that was fantastic. Now show me what a no would sound like. Perfect. Yes, if you disagree with me, just stay silent. At least until the Q&A, and then you can challenge me all you want. First real question. We'll start slow, to make sure we're all on the same page. Before tonight, who here was aware that such a thing existed called pornography? <laughs> Sounds like a yes. Anyone not know what pornography is? Okay, good. I don't have to explain that. <laughs> Did you know that porn, as it is commonly called, can easily be found on the internet. <laughs> well, if you didn't know that, now you know. Do you think that porn use is common? <laughs> what percentage, and you can just feel free to shout this out, but what percentage of male college students in the U.S. <laughs> do you think use porn? 800. <laughs> Here's my numbers, a couple of hundreds, 99. What about female college students? <coughs> Still pretty high. Do you think that your dad uses porn? Uh, <laughs> I don't know for sure whether or not your dad uses porn, don't get me wrong, but the statistics do tell us that 87% of US male college students and 31%, lower than you thought, of female college students are regular users. Uh, to put that into perspective, consider that only 67% of men in the U.S. drink alcohol at all. 
I didn't know any guy in college who didn't use porn, and if you did say that you were such a man, no one was going to believe you. <laughs> Guys would have been like, are you serious? Why not, dude? It was just the norm. It was assumed that you were a guy in college, you were using porn. Now, I'm curious to see if it's the same general culture here. I'd like to see if anyone would like to speak tell us about what the general idea about porn is at the College of Charleston. What people say about it, if they talk about it at all. If you'd like to speak, just go ahead and stand up and we'll get a mic around to you. We have a mic for that, right? Uh, he's coming back with it. Okay. So, well, actually, you're using one of them. <laughs> all right. Would anyone like to talk about that? <laughs> a lot of brave souls. <laughs> It's not going to be much of a conversation, it's just me. This, I'll ask a really simple question. Have you heard anything about porn from your fellow students in the last month, let's say? <coughs> Nobody. Oh, okay. Maybe it's just that people don't talk about porn. <laughs> interesting. All right. Well, on to some more interesting questions. Do you think that masturbating to porn is healthy for people? Nobody, okay. Do you Except think that <laughs> masturbating to porn is unhealthy or bad for people? <laughs> All right. Would anyone like to talk about that? What makes it unhealthy? Good, thank you for sharing. I've heard that a lot. Yeah, that the pornography we watch sets up unrealistic expectations for real sex. Does anyone think that it's neither healthy nor unhealthy, it's just harmless? In my travels, that tends to be the predominant viewpoint. Now, I'm curious, has anyone been to a public event like this before, just for the purpose of discussing porn? <laughs> oh, it's first time. Oh, you have? What was it about? Pizza and porn. Pizza and porn? <laughs> Did you talk about porn? No, I had someone else come in and talk about porn. Okay. What did they say? Just a couple sentences. about like the money that porn Well, I'm so glad that at least one of you has been to an event like this before. Because traditionally, porn use is just not something that's discussed in schools or at home. It's an uncomfortable topic. I've probably made some of you uncomfortable already. Who's uncomfortable? Whoop. Yeah, <laughs> thanks for being honest on that. And it's good to push outside of your comfort zone. I, a few years ago, joked around about porn with my buddies, but I wasn't going to sit down with a parent or and discuss it critically, or stand in front of a room full of strangers and talk about porn, that would have made me pretty uncomfortable. But it's only in the last few years that I've started to see more studies coming out about how porn use affects people and their sexuality long term, and more articles being written about how our lives and our relationships are being shaped in part by the porn that we watch. And the porn watched by our friends, our children, our partners, our parents, politicians, professors, everybody. Has anyone read an article or seen a documentary or heard a news story about porn? Okay. Anyone like to share what that article was about? Go ahead. Put me in. Oh. You're the only one to raise your hand. <laughs> Yeah, I was going to say that there's a documentary on Netflix called Hot Girls Wanted, which talks about the amateur porn business and how um, young girls sort of leave home at a young age and um, get caught up in that business, and it's, um, it's not treated them well. Yeah, I saw that one too. Go ahead. There was an article the other day about how porn had traffic went down 10% since Fallout 4 came out. <laughs> 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 That's probably 
That amuses me. about how people use too much porn no longer are really seeking out real intimacy. I'll talk about that more later. And the reason that we're seeing more of these conversations about porn and the reason that we need to be having more of this dialogue is the same reason that everything else in the world is changing. Yeah, the internet, technology. If you were a person for most of human history who wanted to get off, you had two real options. You could use your imagination and a spare hand, or you could go out in the real world and find an actual person to have sex with, right? It would have been a phenomenal piece of luck even to find an erotic woodcut, or if you were wealthy, maybe you could commission some sexy pottery, or even some erotic literature. But these are all sticks and stones compared to the cruise missile of modern day internet porn. Has anyone heard the news about Playboy? Yeah. yeah. Playboy is no longer going to be featuring nude models in their magazine. They really will just be the articles now. Yeah. They say that that war is won. Those walls are broken down, the levy is breached. Anyone who wants to masturbate anymore isn't going to buy a magazine to do it. They're going to go online, pull out their smartphone, or put on their Oculus Rift. <laughs> For the tech savvy porn fiends, I can hear that people know what that is. It's a virtual reality headset. For those of you who don't know, any of us, we could go online and find any type of pornographic material that we could imagine. And many types that we would not be able to imagine before seeing. <laughs> Completely for free. There are dozens and hundreds of tube sites set up like YouTube where we can stream porn and 27 tabs simultaneously with suggested next videos on the right, all the most popular genres on the left, and search functions based on popularity, submission date, a dozen other factors. Unlimited content, unlimited variety, updated 24-7 from all over the world. The average porn user today can virtually copulate with more hot mates than his ancestors would have even shaken hands with in a lifetime. Right? <laughs> now, this is a brave new world. Gone are those days of hiding our VHS tapes, or awkward checkouts at the porn store, or even buying expensive DVDs. We can just jack in and jack off. With no limitations at all. Adolescents in this country, aged 8 to 18 years old, spend an average of 7 hours and 38 minutes each day using technology for entertainment. And that's the average number, so you know that there are kids out there playing Call of Duty 14 hours a day. And increasingly our lives are mediated by technology in this way. And for many, so is our sexuality. Adolescents, the average age of first exposure to porn, 11 years old. And a study out of Canada shows us that one-third of 13 and 14-year-old boys are already heavy porn users, having viewed porn too many times to count. Did anyone here receive from a parent or a guardian a sex talk? <laughs> Good, using the clapping system. Was that fun for you? <laughs> Nobody. <laughs> Would anyone like to talk about their sex talk experience? Was it good? Did you learn what you needed to learn? <coughs> Anybody? Go ahead, sir. Mine was at Catholic school, so that was, <laughs> it was like nothing you walked out So they taught you how to use condoms, things like that? Just like, don't do it. Don't do it. Go ahead. My older brother be my parents to telling me about the sex talk. Mm -hmm. So they had, they were like, they sat me down and they started telling me everything, and I was like, I already know all of this. <laughs> You're like, wait, what? So we did a good job. <laughs> yeah. Cool, good brother. Did anyone, in addition <laughs> to the sex talk, get a porn talk? <laughs> I did. <laughs> what was said? Uh, basically, just that it's out there and gotta be careful with. 
yourself to and that there's limits and did they give any reason for being careful um yeah pretty much that there like you were saying there's some stuff out there that you can't really imagine mm -hmm. and you don't really know what you're going to get yourself into thanks for sharing that experience I'm going to tell you a story now. It's a story about a horny little boy named Boa Lou. All right, story about me. You got me. I know from talking to hundreds of people about this that many don't start to experience sexual arousal or attraction for others until they hit puberty. But others are just born horny. I was one such child. For me, women were always just wow. And nightly thinking about them and rubbing myself to climax was a ritual for me, I admit it. Now, 1998, 99, it was still the dawn of the internet age when it was just becoming common for households to have an internet connection. And I was a 49 year old boy, and I had this brilliant idea. See, the internet had lots of stuff I knew. Maybe the internet would have pictures of pretty ladies. And my friends, if you've been on the internet, you know that I'm right. There are such pictures. <laughs> so one day when my parents were off doing something else, I sat down at the computer and I typed in those fateful words. Nude. Women. <laughs> Click. And after 30 seconds of waiting for the dial-up to load, <laughs> I was hooked. I had opened up Pandora's box and I found a lot more than I bargained for, but there was no shutting that again. And from then on, whenever I got the chance, I would go back to the computer and look up more. At first, simple nude images or erotic imagery was more than enough for me, but as time went on, I got bored, started downloading videos of actual sex. Lesbian sex was a favorite because who wants to look at a dude? <laughs> Escalated again to oral sex, anal sex, cum shots, bukkakis, rough sex, and on and on, it's some pretty deviant shit that <laughs> would have disgusted me just a couple of years prior. Have you guys heard of the frog in boiling water story? Don't forget the system. I don't know if it's true or not, but they say that the frog, and if you throw it into a pot of boiling water, it's going to jump out hurts. But if you put a frog in room temperature water and bring it to a boil, he'll just stay there because the change is gradual enough and he'll die. That's kind of what porn use was like for me. But there were several times as a teenager when I would find something new and more arousing, more extreme, a little disturbing on the internet, and I would masturbate to it like any teenage boy. And as soon as I climaxed, I would sort of wake up and think, what the hell did I just masturbate to? <laughs> I hope I'm not alone in that experience, so I'm not going to ask if any of you had it as well. I wouldn't say that porn took over my life as an adolescent or anything, but it did start to fill in with the empty spaces my spare time. Instead of fantasizing about adventures I'd like to go on, I would fantasize about what to search for next on the internet. Instead of asking out that girl I liked, I would just use internet porn because it was easier and less risky. Instead of putting myself out there into the world and finding out who I really was, taking risks, I could just stay in and use porn because it was easy. Somehow, by my senior year, I did manage to find myself in a relationship with a girl I really liked, I was really attracted to, and who said we loved each other. And I would go over to her house after school, and we decided to have sex for the first time. You know, in the 45 minutes before her mom got home from work. <laughs> and as we were lying there, naked and kissing, I observed something strange. No boner. I just wasn't very physically aroused, and I just didn't feel that <clears throat> desire that I had always felt with porn with masturbation. I couldn't have sex with her. She didn't understand it. I didn't understand it. I couldn't explain it to her. 
And this didn't just happen once, but over and over again. And I can have a sense of humor about it now, but at the time, well, if any of you have experienced impotence, you know that it's a fucking horrible feeling. I felt like I was broken, like I was less than a man, and I felt really frustrated and confused. I did what any person of my generation would do when confronted with a deeply personal problem like this. I opened up Google. And what I found there was that if I was a young guy, healthy, then it must be performance anxiety that I had gotten too nervous about it being my first time and that got in the way of my ability to have sex. I did feel anxious and frustrated, but I felt like I felt that way because my dick didn't work and not the other way around. I thought it just might be because I masturbated too much, used too much porn, so I would give it a break for a couple of weeks and we'd try again. Still wouldn't work. So I figured the porn couldn't be the problem. I think the worst part about it was that I just wasn't able to talk to her or anybody really about it. Felt ashamed and felt like saying that I had ED or impotence would make it too real. I remember driving home from her house and just beating on the steering wheel and screaming curses at my car. I was so frustrated. I just felt worse and worse about it. Eventually got to the point where I couldn't even be around my girlfriend without feeling horrible, so I broke up with her. I figured I was going off to college anyway, and maybe it would be different with other women. It wasn't. Years passed, and no matter how many times I tried with how many different women, I was completely incapable of having sex. I got to the point where I just didn't want to think about it anymore. I just wanted to live my life and not worry about it, so I stopped trying. I graduated college. I traveled the world and made true friends. I was doing work that I really cared about, and I felt proud of myself. And by the end of the year 2013, I had this curious feeling that I never had before. I was 24 years old, but for the first time in my life, I felt like a man. And I knew that a man solves his problems, he faces them down, he doesn't run away from them. So I decided for the first time in years to try to solve this again. I opened up Google once more, and this time what I found changed my life forever. In the past couple of years, thousands of guys have been coming out online and telling their stories. Stories that sounded a lot like mine. These were young, healthy guys who, either like me, couldn't get erect or stay erect with actual sex, or they had trouble reaching orgasm during sex with an actual partner where they just weren't able to form a loving connection with their partner like they thought they should be able to. And we found out through sharing our stories that we all had one thing in common. Years of internet porn use. Just seeing that there were these other guys out there struggling with the same issue, that was great. And I didn't even know that there was an answer yet. I just knew that I wasn't alone anymore. And that lifted a huge weight off of me. I started to read, just for days, everything I could about what the scientific community knows about how porn affects us, and reading guys' recovery stories, because we found that if they abstained from porn and excess of masturbation for long enough, and we're talking months to a year, that they were able to recover their real libido and have actual sex. Some guys for the first time in their lives. I found out that this phenomenon I suffered from was called porn-induced erectile dysfunction. Has anyone heard of this? Nobody, that sucks. I wanted to be common knowledge. It's unclear how many people have PIED or the other porn-induced sexual dysfunctions, and there are others, but it seemed clear to me that it was far from rare. In 1948, Dr. Alfred Kinsey, he was a pioneer in sex research, he published his findings on male impotence. And he showed that men aged 20 to 45 had impotence rates of about 3%. In 2010, a study of just under 2,000 men showed that they were between the ages of 18 and 40, showed that 35% of them struggled with ED. That was a jump from 3% to 35%. 
And experts have bandied, out, bandied about all sorts of theories about why we've seen this huge rise in youthful ED. Anything from our lives are more stressful to our diets are more processed or we're not getting enough exercise. I'll just say that it seemed clear to me what the real reason was. I'm going to invite Dr. Love, Dr. Todd Love, up to the stage now. He's a psychotherapist who specializes in treating guys with behavioral addictions like video game addictions and porn addiction. He's going to talk to us about what we know in the scientific community of how consistent porn use affects the human brain and the human sexuality. Please welcome Dr. Love. College. I took a different path. Uh, my first career, I spent 15 years in corporate IT. I uh, worked for IBM, they sent me to night school, get an MBA, eventually got bored, went back to night school again, got my law degree, practiced for a few years. Um, I was a DUI defense attorney, and um, I realized I enjoyed counseling people into treatment more than taking their money trying to help them avoid consequences in court. Someone said, you should be the therapist and not the lawyer. So back to night school, I went again. So I get this theme. Um, so anyway, um, completed my core curriculum um, in, in a master's counseling program, transferred into a psychology doctorate, defended my dissertation last year on internet addiction. Um, I collected research from around the world and um, shows that there's plenty of evidence to show or to defend a medical diagnosis of internet addiction with subtypes such as gaming, porn, social networking as a um, addiction disorder. So, um, Licensed as an attorney and a professional counselor in Georgia. At the beginning of this year, I opened a private practice in um, Athens. So, that's my background in a nutshell. Having said that, in case you haven't noticed yet, I'm very ADD. So this means I'm going to jump around, trail off, and interrupt myself. So you get, you get to enjoy that. Um, I've got my notes here to keep myself on track, so I will try to uh, do that. Some of the slides will get more complicated than others, so I'll just read verbatim in the interest of time. So now we're going Okay. First, um, is anybody familiar with this website, Your Brain on Porn? Nobody? Okay, so <clears throat> I want to acknowledge and thank Gary Wilson and this website. Um, he does tremendous work keeping up with the latest research on the topic of um, uh, porn addiction, porn induced erectile dysfunction. It's a very unique public resource because it gathers relevant science, um, explains it accurately for the lay public. Uh, their site traffic is as high as 15 to 20,000 unique visitors per day. So and he does this all at his own expense. Um, there's no profit. He's compiled it into a book called Your Brain on Porn. I think it's nine dollars on Amazon. The proceeds go to a charity in Scotland. So um, with his permission, I'm using some of his slides in this presentation. Um, he has a fantastic TEDx talk um, called The Great Porn Experiment. Um, if you haven't seen it, which I'm guessing nobody has, because they don't have a website, you should watch it. So, okay. I'm going to show two little videos that explain the uh, science of addiction. They do it more fun than I will, so that's how I'm going to do it. Welcome to Two Minute Neuroscience, where I simplistically explain neuroscience topics in two minutes or less. In this installment, I will discuss the reward system. The reward system refers to a group of structures that are activated whenever we experience something rewarding, like using an addictive drug. When exposed to a rewarding stimulus, the brain responds by increasing release of the neurotransmitter dopamine. Thus, structures that are considered part of the reward system are found along the major dopamine pathways in the brain. The pathway most often associated with reward is the mesolimbic dopamine pathway, which starts in an area of the brain stem called the ventral tegmental area, or VTA. The VTA is one of the principal dopamine producing areas in the brain, and the mesolimbic dopamine pathway connects it with the nucleus accumbens, a nucleus found in a part of the brain that is strongly associated with motivation and reward, called the ventral striatum. When we use an addictive drug or experience something rewarding, dopamine neurons in the VTA are activated. These neurons project to the nucleus accumbens via the mesolimbic dopamine pathway, and their activation causes dopamine levels in the nucleus accumbens to rise. Another major dopamine pathway, the mesocortical pathway, also originates in the VTA but travels to the cerebral cortex, specifically to the frontal lobes. It is also activated during rewarding experiences and is considered part of the reward system. 
Because dopamine is released whenever we use an addictive drug, researchers initially thought dopamine must be the neurotransmitter that causes pleasure. More recent research, however, suggests that dopamine activity doesn't correlate exactly with pleasure. For example, dopamine neurons are activated before a reward is actually received, and thus before the pleasure is experienced. For this and other reasons, it is now thought that dopamine has roles other than causing pleasure, such as assigning importance to environmental stimuli associated with rewards and increasing reward seeking. Whatever the precise role of dopamine and reward is, the mesolimbic dopamine pathway is consistently activated during rewarding experiences, leading it to be considered the main structure of the reward system. Regardless, the actual network of brain structures involved in mediating reward is much larger and more complex than just this dopamine pathway, involving many other brain regions and neurotransmitters. The brain is a team of rivals? There are basically two parts of our brain, the neocortex and the limbic system. These two brain structures fight against each other for dominance. Neuroscientists call the brain a team of rivals because the brain structures are in continual conflict. The prefrontal cortex, for example, is a higher functioning part of the brain that is rational, logical, and it understands consequences. But the limbic system is a primitive brain. The limbic system was the first to develop in evolution and human development. The limbic system has no ability to delay gratification. It is not rational, but pleasure-oriented and emotional. When we take drugs into our body, it activates this limbic reward system, and it is extremely powerful. When we get a burst of dopamine, the limbic system starts to override the rational brain structure and subdues it. Scientists have examined the brain of addicts and call it fundamentally irrational, because addicts continue to use their drug of choice regardless of its worsening consequences. All right, so now I'm going to show a few somewhat gratuitous slides um, about the brain. Um, I'm not going to go into any of the details because we don't have time. So there is a neuron, there's the head, there's the tail, there's the body. That's an offensive oversimplification, but I'm going to keep moving. <laughs> Synapse, so there's the end of one neuron, the beginning of another. Uh, this is where the neurotransmitters package the release of dopamine or whatever. Some of the complex stuff goes in there right above my head, so we're not going to talk about that either. Um, we will talk about this. So, in 2007, well-known author and psychiatrist Norman Doidge wrote a New York Times bestseller, uh, The Brain That Changes Itself. It's about brain plasticity. Um, he, he talked about how addiction involves major brain changes, including sensitization, desensitization, and hypofrontality. So we're going to learn first about sensitization. Um, sensitization and other forms of learning, this is how learning happens, um, are governed by the simple principle of nerve cells that fire together, wire together. So here's a picture of three nerve cells connected with the top two communicating and firing together. In this simplified model, the first nerve cell might be your favorite addictive whatever. So um, drug, um, porn star, craps table, whatever it is that someone's addicted to. Second nerve cell would be in the reward center. So look where the arrow is pointing. The number of nerve connections is about to increase. So now there's more, on, there's more connections along with chemical changes that facilitate communication. So when a memory or cue activates your addictive whatever nerve cells, your reward center nerve cells are blasted with impulses, which experiences cravings to engage in the behavior or consume the chemical. Uh, the same mechanism is at work, whether it's cues for a um, cocaine addiction, a bag of white powder, or a gambling addiction, somebody throws down the dice, or somebody who's addicted to porn. You show their favorite logo of their whatever, the brain lights up in the exact same area. So, Forming new brain pathways falls under the umbrella term. Examples include forgetting most everything you learned in school, which you'll do soon enough, and uh, forming and breaking a bad habit. Uh, sometimes we lump these two together and call it rewiring the brain. So neuroplasticity refers to the brain's ability to change um, and adapt as a result of experience. So people formerly thought that addiction was only to drugs and alcohol. However, based on decades of human and animal research showing that what we just saw happens in the brains of uh, chemical addicts also happens in the brains of people who compulsively engage in behaviors. In 2011, the American Society of Addiction Medicine released a uh, landmark new medical definition of addiction, uh, declaring that it is one condition, one condition, alcohol, cocaine, gambling, sex. Um, so they just came out with a book called Addiction is Addiction is Addiction. Doesn't matter what it is. So, <clears throat> We've talk, been talking about addiction in general, so now we're going to get more specific to sex. 
Um, by the way, if you've ever wanted to see pictures of rats having sex, it's your lucky day because you're about to. <laughs> so, um, so what happens when you drop a male rat into a cage with a receptive female rat? First, you see a frenzy of copulation. Progressively, um, the male tires a female one. She wants more, but he's just had enough and he can't get excited anymore. However, if you replace the original female with a new one, the male immediately revives and gallantly struggles to fertilize her. So you can repeat this new process with females um, over and over and over until the rat is completely wiped out. <laughs> so this is called the Coolidge effect. Um, why are the males losing interest? Uh, the reward, rats reward circuits are releasing less and less dopamine with result to the current female, but produce a big dopamine uh, surge for new females, thus briefly renewing vigor and sexual desire. Uh, it's an, this ancient biological paradigm helps to ensure genetic diversity and make sure no female goes unfertilized. So, um, yeah. So, internet points in the stream of sexual no uh, novelties exploits this um, ancient biological program, Coolidge Effect. Is every additional female slightly lower, like to begin with, than the one before? So um, I had a slide that I took out for um, in the interest of time, but there's one um, he has, in, or Gary has in the um, TEDx presentation where there's a, they did um, rams and ewes, and so they had ram with this same ewe, and the time to ejaculation went longer and longer and longer. And then they did the same experiment, but every time he ejaculated, they would then produce a new one. He went two minutes over and over and over and over again until he was just exhausted. So that's the Coolidge effect. <coughs> Okay, so now to add a, um, another key ingredient, and that is supernormal stimulus. Uh, years ago, Nobel laureate Nicholas Tinbergen coined the term supernormal stimulus. In his experiments, um, he discovered that birds and butterflies and other animals could be duped into preferring fake eggs and mates. For example, shorebirds would abandon their own smaller eggs um, to incubate much larger, more colorful plaster eggs that he and his lab assistants fabricated. The same with butterflies. Males would attempt to mate with cardboard butterflies that had bigger and more colorful wings, enjoy, um, ignoring real female butterflies. So, um, random example, modern junk food is a prime example of supernormal stimulus with its never before seen combinations of salt, uh, fats, sugars, textures, all that. So, a supernormal stimulus can be defined as an exaggerated version of a normal stimulus that amplifies qualities we find especially compelling such as in endless novelty at a click. Uh, so for the first time in human history, we have an endless stream of novelty available on the internet. With each click, swipe, Facebook like, text message, email, cat video, we receive a little squirt of dopamine instead. Endless novelty definitely makes internet porn a supernormal stimulus. So what we have is an evolutionary mismatch. A co-author of Mean Genes says, all excessive stimulations of reward circuitry that are not um, behaviors for the um, for which it originally evolved are problematic. Like crack and Krispy Kreme donuts, internet porn is another manifestation of mismatch. So how is all, all this related? It shows how we are particularly sensitive or predisposed to respond to sexual cues. Beyond the naturally high dopamine levels of sexual stimulation, internet porn has unique properties that can keep dopamine surging. Um, first is endless novelty, which each new image, new porn star, uh, you get an extra squirt of dopamine, will effect. Searching and seeking, keep, keep dopamine um, elevated. The reward circuit is the uh, seeking circuit. And anticipation is huge. Anticipation of the next sex act, image, video, whatever. Sexual tastes vary from person to person, but with the current pornography epidemic, as some call it, one has to wonder how exactly this may affect our desires and perception of sexuality. Moreover, how does it affect our sex lives? Pornography constitutes about 25% of all search engine requests and is the fourth most common reason people give for going on the internet. And while it may seem to simply facilitate an instinctual sexual response linked to millions of years of evolution, the truth is, pornography has dynamically changed over time, ultimately molding our tastes and desires. The not-so-shocking truth is that pornography has profound consequences for the brain and acts in many ways like a drug. With prolonged exposure, your tolerance is increased and many often find themselves addicted. Though it's not a physical substance, it leads to the same general loss of control, the compulsiveness to seek out the activity despite negative consequences, and withdrawal when it goes away, much like that of gambling or running, for example. 
The issue is that continued exposure can cause long-term or even lifelong neuroplastic change in the brain. Dopamine is released as a reward whenever we accomplish something, whether it be eating to sustain life or sexual activity to produce future life. And this dopamine consolidates neural connections in order to drive us to perform the same activity in the future. In other words, it alters and forms the brain cells to motivate certain actions. It rewires your brain. The National Institutes of Health measure drug addictiveness by testing rats. The rat is trained to press a button in order to get a drug, and the harder it works indicates how addictive the substance is. It turns out that the more addictive a drug is, the more dopamine we see released. And while there is, unfortunately, no rat porn that we can give to them, we do know that dopamine is also released during sexual excitement, which pornography plays right into. The more time you spend doing it, the more dopamine gets released, which reinforces the behavior and makes you not only desire it in the future, but require it. And as you begin to imagine these images away from the computer or while having sex, they become reinforced. Furthermore, each orgasm releases even more dopamine, which consolidates the connections made during the session. It's a feedback loop that becomes harder to escape. And just like a drug, your tolerance for visual stimulation has now compounded, making it more difficult to be turned on by reality. Pornography addiction can often lead to finding your mate less attractive. The good news is, it doesn't have to be permanent. Usually when people understand the mechanism and realize it's affecting their relationships, they can stop. The brain is often described as a use it or lose it system because the neural connections you stimulate grow stronger and desire to be activated, while the ones you ignore become weakened. Much like your muscles, which, if sitting still all day, itch for activity, but after prolonged non-use, they become complacent. Luckily, because of this use it or lose it brain, the same neuroplastic system that proliferates these habits can also be used to acquire healthier ones. Alright, so there we go. So let's talk more specifically about internet pornography addiction. Uh, there's myriads of studies on psychological, sociological, clinical treatment, feminist theory, content analysis, etc. We're not talking about any of that. Um, there's no judgment of porn um, here, pornography use, pornography users. That's, you know, this is just the um, reviewing the neuroscience of how people can get addicted uh, to pornography, the same as we've said before, as if it was gambling, gaming, drugs. So there's two recent um, studies by addiction neuroscience at Cambridge University. Both studies carefully screened porn addicts um, and compared them to control groups and found sensitization in the brains of porn addicts. In other words, the porn addicts reward centers lit up when exposed to porn far more than the normal healthy controls, and just like the brains of uh, drug addicts when they're exposed to drug-related cues or triggers. I think they were using cocaine addicts to compare, I guess. Another key study was done by top neuroscience at the prestigious Max Planck Institute in Germany. Uh, the study correlated the amount of porn <coughs> used with changes in brain structures and how the reward circuit responded to sexual images. Researchers found higher hours per week and more years of porn viewing correlated with a reduction in gray matter in parts of the reward center. This is um, desensitization. So the lead author stated, We'd often say that, that could mean that regular consumption of pornography more or less wears up your reward system. Researchers also found that porn use correlated with lower brain active activation while viewing sexual images. The lead author stated, we assume that subjects with a high porn consumption need increasing stimulation to really receive the same amount of reward. So the same uh, study also found evidence for hypofrontality, um, which as we have seen is the third major brain change caused by addiction. Uh, recall from the team of rivals video, it was a weakening of the mesocortical pathway in favor of the mesolimbic. With hypofrontality, the frontal lobes undergo chemical and structural changes, leading to a weakened willpower and a hard time controlling use. So the Max Planck study found that the nerve connections between the reward circuit and the prefrontal cortex worsened with increased form viewing. As the study explained, dysfunction in the circuitry has been related to inappropriate behavioral choices, such as drug seeking, regardless of the potential negative outcome. So here's one way to visualize sensitization and desensitization. On the left, we have sensitization or the addiction, whatever it is. Any cues associated with the addiction blast the reward circuit with dopamine and other neurochemicals. On the right, desensitization is represented, which is pretty much everything else in your life except the addiction. Everything is far less interesting um, and stimulating than it used to be. Socializing, sports, movies, eating, even sex. 
So the principal driver of addiction is this imbalance between the overpowering cravings um, to use caused by sensitization, uh, experiencing less pleasure with everyday activities caused by desensitization. So, collateral damage. You like that slide? I like it. Okay, let's learn how this works. I didn't make it. Um, so let's visualize the fire together, wired together principle at work in a 13 year old boy just discovering his sexuality via tube sites. Um, adding internet porn into the normal developmental mix of sexuality creates two competing sexual pathways, the porn in yellow and the real sex in white. Sure, Sally in history class is cute, but if a 13 year old boy is masturbating every day to explicit hardcore porn, the Sally pathways are gonna have a hard time keeping up. Here's why. He's not masturbating to the thoughts of Sally, but to porn. His brain is constantly reinforcing the stimuli he associates with uh, masturbation and ejaculation. So the sensitized porn pathway is now the preferred pathway because it leads to a bigger reward than the uh, real pathway. So the white line representing the real pathway is dotted because disuse weakens it. So, as Norman Doidge summarizes, because plasticity is competitive, brain maps for new exciting images increased at the expense of what had previously attracted them. Whether we call it brain maps, sensitized porn pathways, sexual conditioning, or as Gary Wilson from my DOP puts it, this is what turns me on, it all comes down to training the brain to expect sexual arousal under specific conditions. With internet porn, these conditions include being alone, sitting in a chair, voyeurism rather than participation, continuously seeking and searching for the next hit of dopamine, constant novelty with each click, multiple tabs, each with a three minute video, shock and surprise to maintain arousal, new genres of uh, porn to overcome habituation, multiple porn stars per session, fetishes of every imaginable type uh, and unimaginable. Now, while this type of sexual conditioning is far more powerful during adolescence, it can occur in any age. So, whether you're 22 or 52, the disparity between real sex and masturbating to internet porn is a major factor in both porn-induced sexual problems and the inability to quit using porn. Sensitized porn pathways light up for one type of experience, while real sex is a completely different kind of experience. So many with porn-induced fetishes or porn-induced ED need not only to stop using porn, but they need to allow their brains to rewire sexual arousal to a real person, real partner. So what happens when people quit? Initially, things get worse. Um, people confuse chemical detox with addiction withdrawal. So the, the latter is an affective process. These signs are seen when recovering from pretty much any addiction, um, except perhaps the last. It's unique to porn users. Uh, some, not all, experience a loss of libido, called it the flat line, which can last for weeks and months. What happens when you quit and go through that? Eventually, you get your brain back. Uh, your brain on porn has collected stories of over 1,500 porn addicts from around the world and found that common, unexpected benefits of quitting compulsive use are what you see here. Note again, however, that a lot of these get worse before they get better. Um, some key points uh, on here are most had no idea that they were lethargic or lack motivation until they quit using porn, and then they experience big increases in energy and motivation. People begin to feel uh, emotionally again. Uh, they report more connection to others, and some people actually say colors seem brighter, dreams are more vivid, vivid creativity surges. People report social anxiety decreases, often significantly, and others report newfound confidence, which may be the uh, most commonly reported video and benefit. So, that is my nice Give another hand. It was two years ago when I was learning everything that the doctor just explained to us. And I realized then that I was never going to use porn again. And the thought of doing so made me sick, knowing how it had twisted my sexuality and taken away my ability to have the real intimacy and connection with women that I actually wanted. And after I quit, I felt pretty great. I was filled with lights and hope because I had finally found a solution and I was moving toward it after years of not knowing what was wrong with me. I felt charged with ambition and motivation. I was eating better and exercising and socializing more, like he said. I felt like my brain was firing on all cylinders for the first time in a long time. I started to connect more genuinely with people in my life. I had told people about this journey I was on. I told my friends, inspiring some of them to quit porn as well. 
I have told complete strangers like yourselves. I have told my family, my parents. And I found that as I was opening up and finally letting go of all these secrets I had held on to for a long time, I was also letting go of shame. Not shame at using porn, but shame at presenting myself as other than I really was. And I just felt like I was able to walk around in the world with nothing to hide and nothing to fear. And that was an incredible feeling. I still feel that today. I started to experience day-to-day -day emotions more vibrantly. I remember being in the back of a car with my family and this new story came on over the radio about a murder. I just felt it, really, in a way that I hadn't ever felt news before, and I started to cry in the back seat. And understand, it had been nearly 15 years, and I hadn't cried a single time. And I started to cry, and I pressed my face against the window so that my parents wouldn't see me and ask me what the hell was wrong with me. <laughs> And as I was crying against the window, I realized that those 15 years in which I hadn't cried at all were the same 15 years in which I had used porn. And I wasn't expecting all this messy emotional growth. I just wanted my dick back, really. <laughs> but like the doctor was explaining, that dopaminergic system in my brain that was responsible for driving me towards sex was responsible for a lot more than that. It was responsible for driving me towards social connection ambition, creativity, creation, life. And by deadening and desensitizing that system over years with internet porn use, I had been graying out in my life. But by healing that part of me, it was like discovering who I should have been all along. It was great. Around this time, pretty early on really, as I was going through this journey, I did meet a special lady. And on our third date, I told her all about this. I told her about growing up in porn, about developing PIED, about all the relationships I had broken because of it, because I didn't understand it and couldn't face it. And I told her about recovery. Admittedly, this is a lot of information for the third date. Uh, who thinks this went horribly awry? Probably. I wouldn't blame you. <laughs> who thinks it went well? The optimists, you are my people. It went well. We fell in love. And with her, I thought I'd been in love before, but with her I realized that I hadn't. And I don't know if that's because I was desensitized by porn or what, but regardless, I was able to feel that with her. And that's something that I'll always be grateful for. Long story short, and I can go into more detail here in the Q&A if you want. But on day 72 of my journey away from porn, for the first time in my life, I had real, full, successful sex. I wasn't fully recovered at this time still. In fact, it took me nearly a year to fully recover my libido and my erectile strength and sensitivity to the point with real partners where I thought I should be. But I could tell that I was on the right path and I felt like I had a new life. It was pretty good. <laughs> now, it wasn't always easy. I had to face the fact, and I never considered this before, but I had to face the fact that I was an addict. See, I had come to use porn as a way of avoiding hard feelings like insecurity, disappointment, loneliness. Instead of dealing with those emotions, I could just forget about it all forget about my life, my problems, the whole world, and just use porn, shove it to the side. But I didn't realize until I quit that by closing off myself from all those hard feelings, I was also shutting out true joy. And I think I knew all along that porn was probably the cause of my problems, but I tried to quit several times before, and it, without actually knowing the science about PIED and porn addiction, I was always able to rationalize my way back down the slippery slope and start using again. It wasn't until I learned everything that doc the doctor explained that I was finally able to quit. Many people who try to quit 
find that it's just as difficult or more difficult as more commonly recognized addictive substances. It's like trying to quit drugs when the crack pipe is attached to your body. And uh, there's a dealer living in your bedroom constantly offering you free samples. It's hard. But I did, looking back, experience withdrawal symptoms like the doctor was talking about. I felt irrational mood swings, cravings, depression, anxiety. And I had to learn to face all these and process them without running away like I used to. I learned that addiction, in any form, is about looking for satisfaction in the wrong places. In Chinese Buddhism, there is this idea of a hungry ghost. Has anyone heard of that? Yeah. The hungry ghosts are these spirits with tiny little mouths and great big bellies. And no matter how much they eat and how fast, they can never be satisfied. And that's what addiction is like, I think. You're always hungry. But what I really wanted was intimacy and love and connection with women. But instead, I fed my lust with internet porn. And the more that I did that, the farther away I was from what I really wanted. And sexuality wasn't the only aspect of my life in which I did that. If I wanted achievements, I could just rack up virtual accomplishments in video games. It was easy. If I wanted social connection, I could open up Facebook. If I wanted to be distracted, I could binge eat, watch Netflix, go out and drink till I was stupid. But all these had one thing in common. After I indulged in them, I didn't feel happy or satisfied, I felt emptier. I felt emptier. I had to train myself to face the problems in my life without running away from them. And it was like being awake after years of being asleep. I'm not gonna lie to you, being awake hurts like hell sometimes. But it can also be really incredible. As all this was happening, I thought back six years prior to when I was first looking for answers, and I really found nothing and nobody who could help me or tell me what was really going on. And that sucked. I decided I didn't want anyone else to go through that, so I started to speak out, share my experience, and offer guidance and help to those who needed it. I shared my experience any way that I could think to. I wrote a book, made videos, started speaking in public like this and coaching individuals in private. And all these men and women from all over the world started to reach out to me. These were males, females, teenagers, people in their 60s, husbands, wives, parents. They had lost relationships, broken marriages, some even attempted suicide. I tried to show them that there's hope. Many people who have spoken out against porn in the past have done so from a religious or a moral standpoint. And that's not me. I'm not here to stir up a moral outrage. I don't want to ban porn. I don't want to ban cigarettes either. What I do want is for the potential dangers of porn use to be as common knowledge as the potential dangers of tobacco use. That way people can make informed decisions and find help if they need it. That's why I'm here tonight.